for this block of scripture of the Come Follow Me lessons is Romans chapter 7 through 16, which is quite lengthy. And so I have split this up into three different presentations so that it's not quite so long in just one sitting. And so this first section we will consider Romans 7 through 9. Romans 7, the law of Christ replaces the law of Moses. Paul's presentation here is obscure and difficult. From the King James record alone, it is almost impossible to comprehend it. The inspired version clarifies and improves the account immeasurably, but even the numerous changes and additions made by the prophet do not leave us with an incisive and plain summary of what the apostle had in mind. Something, however, should be said in mitigation of the obscurity and ambiguity of the argument Paul makes. The fact is that the philosophical problems facing his Roman readers were wholly different from those with which we wrestle today. We do not have the Mosaic background and are not concerned with the law of Moses, of how the law of Moses died in Christ. We are not confronted with the problem of rationalizing away those performances which has been drilled into Israel for 1,500 years. We are not faced with the problem of showing that the gospel grew out of the Mosaic order. Today our problem is a comparable situation, is one of showing that there was a falling away from the doctrines and powers of primitive Christianity, and that growing out of this apostasy, there had been a glorious restoration. Unfortunately, towards the end of the Old Testament, the law of Moses became a law in and to itself and not a teaching me uh, method used to point to Christ. And the Jews had missed that that it was used to point to Christ in his crucifixion and his resurrection. Nonetheless, Paul's argument, given of old, does have worth and merit for us. It enables us to get an overall view of God's dealings with men. It helps us understand better what we, have, what we do have in the revealed religion which has come to us. In effect, Paul is saying that the law of Moses was good in its day, that God gave it for a purpose, but now it is dead. And in place thereof, God has given a higher law to which all men must now turn for salvation. That was the purpose of the law of Moses, to get them ready for the higher law. And the Jews had missed that point or had forgot that point and turn the law of Moses into that which will save you, which was not true. Moses 7, 1 through 4, a metaphor of two marriages. Freed from the law of Moses, joined to Christ, Paul used a marriage metaphor to explain that Israel was once bound to the law of Moses as a wife is bound to her husband. But now that the law is fulfilled, Israel should be bound or married to Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained in Romans 7, 1 through 4, Paul compares Israel's allegiance to the law of Moses with that of a wife to her husband. As long as her husband lives, the wife is bound to him, but must obey his laws, and if she be with another, she is an adulteress. But when the husband dies, he can no longer direct her actions, and she is free to marry another. She can no longer be subject to him that is dead. So with Israel and the law, as long as the law lived and was therefore enforced, Israel was married to it and required to obey its provisions. But now that the law is fulfilled, it, is no, it no longer lives. It has become dead in Christ. And, is married, and Israel is married to another, even Christ, whose gospel law must now be obeyed. Romans 7, 5 through 14 and chapter 8, 3 through 4, 4, what the law could not do. Some devout Jews had accused Paul of speaking blasphemously against the law of Moses. See Acts 21, 28. In Romans 7 through 8, Paul clarifies his position 
by explaining that the law of Moses was good but had its limitations. The law taught what sin was, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, and therefore the law was holy. But the law could not overcome the effects of the fall, which way it makes mankind carnal, sold under sin. And the law alone could not correct the problem of human weakness or provide means for people to be transformed by the Spirit. For that, we need the grace made available through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Remember, the law of Moses was under the direction of the Aaronic priesthood, which did not have the power to give the gift of the Holy Ghost, which a majority of Israel did not have. They could be guided from time to time by the Holy Ghost, but to have the gift daily was not a part or available to them because they, they were so low in knowledge of the gospel, they needed a law that was a little less to help them learn about the law of Christ. From the Joseph Smith translation, Romans 7, 7 through 8, the law of Moses was good in its day on time and season. By it, Paul learned the course in which he should walk. When he failed to keep the law, he committed sin, sin for which he could not have been accountable except for the law. Romans 7, 9, once Paul was alive spiritually in the sense that he obeyed the law of Moses, which was a spiritual light God had given his people, but when Christ came and fulfilled and replaced the law, then Paul died spiritually because the law itself was dead and therefore no longer had any saving grace. The only way the law of Moses had any saving grace was that if you use the law of Moses to point you to Christ, and then you put your faith in Christ, and then you got your grace from Christ. It was because the Jews stopped using the law of Moses to point them to Christ is what got them into trouble, spiritually. Romans 7.10, but not accepting the gospel when it came, so as to be born again and become alive spiritually, Paul was condemned to spiritual death. Romans 7.11 Because of sin, he denied the gospel and was slain spiritually. That is, he remained spiritually dead. Romans 7.12 The law of Moses was holy as long as it was in force, and the gospel which replaced it is now holy, just, and good. Romans 7.13-16 when Paul was subjected to the law of Moses, he was yet carnal. That is, he was yet in his sins. But now, because of the gospel, being born again, he has become spiritual. And the proof of his spirituality is that he keeps the commandments. That is true today. As Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're fooling ourselves, brothers and sisters, if we think we can be inactive, not keep the commandments, and say that we love Christ. Romans 7:17. 7, now Paul philosophizes, philosophizes, since he obeys the higher gospel law, he cannot be condemned for failure to keep the law of Moses' stand, Mosaic standard. It is as though a Mormon elder said to a sectarian Christian, Keep all the good you have in your church and add it to the further learnt knowledge we have received in this day. And then ask such person, How can you be condemned for living all the good principles you already have simply because you accept the added truths that have come by revelation in this day? Romans 7, 18-27 The conflict between the flesh and the inward man. And so Paul seeks to overcome sin, to subdue the, and control the lust of the flesh. This is possible only through the grace and power of Christ. The natural man needs assistance from Christ to rise above the carnal state. 
assistance that comes because of the atonement and was not available through the law of Moses alone. See, just the law of Moses alone could not save anything. It was using the law of Moses to come unto Christ and putting your faith in Christ that gave you assistance and help. But even after the gospel law is imprinted in his mind, carnal desires persist. And if they are not subdued, he is not justified. But praise God, righteousness and salvation are available through Christ, and the faithful shall come off triumphant. President Russell M. Nelson spoke of the trials related to our physical bodies. Not an age in life passes without temptation, trial, or torment experienced through your physical body. But as you prayerfully develop self-mastery, desires of the flesh may be subdued. And when that has been achieved, you may have the strength to submit to your Heavenly Father as Jesus, who said, Not my will, but thine be done. When deepening trials come your way, Remember this glorious promise of the Savior. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also come and sit down with my Father in his throne. That's Revelation 3, 21. What a great promise that we should keep in our minds to help us with our mortal afflictions. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, the law of Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, Paul referred often to the spirit and to the flesh. Without the word spirit, he was primarily referring, with the word spirit, he was primarily referring to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 2 or to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ established after the law of Moses. With the word flesh, he was primarily referring to the law of Moses, which was weak through the flesh, Romans 8 through 3. Remember, it was the law given after carnal commandments, or commandments of the flesh. Ella Brufa McConkie said of Romans 8, 1 through 3, Life and peace come not through the law of Moses, but through Christ and his saving grace. Though Mosaic performances deal with carnal things, the things of the flesh, the things of death, this is, there is not power in them to atone, to ransom, to save, to bring joy and peace here and eternal life hereafter. But Christ deals with spiritual things, the things of the Spirit, the things that bring life. Because of him, he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Doctrine and Covenants 59, 23. Romans 8, verse 1. Failure to keep the law of Moses does not condemn church members who keep the commandments of the Lord. Romans 8, 2, the law of the gospel frees men from keeping the law of Moses. Ver Romans 8, 3, the law of Moses could not save men from sin, but the atonement of Christ does. Romans 8, 4, Paul is trying to say that the law of Moses is fulfilled. Romans 8, 5, those who had the law were concerned with carnal things, things of the flesh, temporal things. Those who have the gospel was spiritual. Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is eternal life. Compare that to 2 Nephi 9:39. O oh, my beloved brethren, remember the awfulness in transgressing against the Holy Ghost, and also, also the awfulness of yielding to the enticings of that cunning one. Remember, to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life eternal. Carnally minded would be that we are sensual, devilish, and fallen, the natural man. Or spiritually minded is that we're focused on Christ. 
Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is an enemy against God. Compare that with Mosiah 3, 19, the natural man is an enemy to God. The natural man would be a carnal man and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields unto the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. The law of Moses did not have the ability or power to make you a saint because there was no atonement made, uh, made yet. That if you focus just on the law of Moses, now if you used it to focus on Christ and his atonement that was to come, then it was effective in forgiveness of your sins. But you had to use it so that it pointed you to Christ. Romans 8, 9. Those who have the Spirit of God are not carnal. Unless they have this Spirit, they are not Christ. Romans 8, 10. Christ dwells in those who have his mind, who believe and think and acts as he does. Thus the resurrected Lord petitioned his Father for ref with reference to the, his Nephite disciples, saying, I pray that I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one, that I may be glorified in them. 3 Nephi 19, 29. Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, your body is quickened. You are changed from your carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons of daughters. Mosiah 27:25, Romans 8, 12 through 13. Paul was saying, Therefore we are not indebted to the law of Moses for salvation, but to Christ, through whose spirit and power we can overcome the flesh and live in the spirit. Romans 8, 13. Mortifying the deeds of the body through the spirit. Some groups in Christianity and other religion traditions have believed that the only way to overcome desires of the flesh is to abstain completely from physical pleasures. However, many physical pleasures are not sinful but are good. Paul taught that the companionship of the Holy Spirit can make it possible for us to use our bodies according to God's purposes for his children. The Spirit can mortify put to death or subdued the deeds of the body and impart spiritual life. Elder Parley P. Pratt of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles similarly taught, the gift of the Holy Ghost purifies all the natural passions and affections and adapts them by the gift of wisdom to their lawful use. Romans 8.14 the scriptures speak of us as children of God in more than one sense. Romans 8.16 First, every human being is literally a beloved spirit child of Heavenly Father. The family of proclamation to the world it proclaims that. Second, we are reborn as children of God through a covenantal relationship when we manifest faith in Christ, repent, are baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost. Romans 8.15, Paul is saying the spirit of adoption is trying to now explain that what that means. Caesar Augustus, who was the ruler of Rome at the time of Christ's birth, was adopted by his predecessor, Julius Caesar. Adoption was common in the Roman world and would have been a familiar concept to Paul's readers. A person who legally adopted someone conferred on that person all the rights and privileges that a natural-born child would have. Therefore, when we receive the spirit of adoption, Romans 8.15, through entering the gospel covenant, that would be through baptism, we become the children of God and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17. Romans 8, 15. You are no longer servants. You are not in bondage, for you have been adopted as sons, 
into the family of God, the Father, Abba, Father. Meaning, Abba is the Aramaic term of Father, and the adopted sons in the family of the Eternal Father are privileged to address, address Him, who is the ruler of the universe in this intimate way. Romans 8.16, Paul is trying to say, the context makes clear that Paul is speaking of the second covenantal meaning when he stated, We are the children of God. The children of God that Paul spoke of were those who, by virtue of their covenant relationship with Christ, were led by the Spirit of God. Romans 8.14 The companionship of the Holy Ghost is God's assurance we are His covenant children, that if we are faithful, we will one day be glorified together with Christ, Romans 8, 16 through 17. The blessings Paul discussed in Romans 8, blessings such as being heirs of God, verse 17, the Spirit's intercession on our behalf, and the full manifestations of God's enduring love are enjoyed by God's covenant children, but not necessarily by all of his spirit children. If we don't enter into the covenant, then we cannot receive the blessings of the covenant, which is becoming an heir of God. Romans 8, 17, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained what it means to be joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17, a joint heir is one who inherits equally with all other heirs, including the chief heir, who is the son. Each joint heir has an equal and an undivided portion of the whole of everything. If one knows all things, so do all others. If one has all power, so, so do all those who inherit jointly with him. Boy, there is a great blessing and a, and a good reason to strive the best we can to follow the gospel so that we can know and do and have power jointly with Jesus Christ. President Dallin H. Oaks is the first presence he taught that becoming heirs of God means that we become like God. In the theology of the restored church of Jesus Christ, the purpose of mortal life is to prepare us to realize our destiny as sons and daughters of God to become like him. The Bible describes mortals as the children of God and as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 16, 17. It also declares that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together, Romans 8, 17. And then when he shall appear, we shall be like him, 1 John 3, 2. We take these Bible teachings literally. We believe that the purpose of mortal life is to, is to acquire a physical body and through the atonement of Jesus Christ and by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel to qualify for the glorified, resurrected celestial state that is called exaltation or eternal life. In his famous King Follett sermon, Speaking of those who shall be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, the prophet Joseph Smith asked what their glory should be. Answering his own query, he described joint heirship as an inheriting the same power, the same glory, and the same exaltation until you arrive at the station of a God and ascend the throne of eternal power the same as those who have gone before. Romans 8, 17, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ continued. When Paul declared that we must suffer with Christ, he did not mean that we would suffer what the Savior did as part of his atoning sacrifice, but rather that we would go through our own suffering with him. Elder Keith R. Edwards of the Seventy explained that approaching suffering in this way allows us to know the Savior better. Quoting Elder Edwards, We can learn spiritual lessons if we can approach suffering, sorrow, or grief with a focus on Christ. 
Anciently, Paul wrote that our suffering may give us an opportunity to know the Savior better. Paul wrote to the Romans, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, least anyone go looking for hardship and suffering, that is not what is taught. Rather, it is the attitude which we approach our hardships and trials that allow us to know the Savior better. As we are called upon to endure suffering, sometimes inflicted on us unintentionally or negligently, we are put in a unique position. If we choose, we may be allowed to have a new awareness of the suffering of the Son of God. We can have a greater appreciation for that which He did, and we can feel His Spirit suckering us, and we can know the Savior in a very real sense. End of his quote. Romans 8, 18. Our earthly suffering will be considered a light thing when compared to the glory of exaltation. That we need to keep eternally in our minds, to have an eternal perspective. That what we will gain in exaltation that is, be, is so incomprehensible will be worth any of the earthly sufferings we go through. And we will literally see that they were a light thing. Romans 8, 20, 22. Man is subject to the trials of mortality. If faithful, he receives the hope of eternal life. Man is the creature. All creatures, create, all created beings are the whole of creation. Paul is speaking of the need for men as part of their adoption of the family of God to become, as Alma expressed it, new creatures. That is to be born again, yea, born of God, to change from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, Mosiah 27:25. Romans 8:21, bondage of sin in which men are bound by the chains of hell, liberty of the children of God, meaning the truth shall make you free. Romans 8:22, all men are as in the pain of travail awaiting the new birth of the spirit. Romans 8.23 And even the saints who already have the spirit birth yet struggle as in travail awaiting the final redemption of the soul. Just because we become born again, become new creatures in Christ and join heirs with him and follow his gospel and keep all his commandments, we will still struggle and have afflictions. Romans 8.24 As used in the Revelations, hope is the desire of faithful people to gain eternal salvation and the kingdom of God hereafter. It is not a flimsy, erethial desire, one without assurance that the desired consummation will be received, but a desire coupled with full expectation of receiving the coveted reward. That's what hope is in the scriptures. You have full expectation of receiving the rewards of keeping your covenants. Paul, for instance, was not hesitant in affirming that he lived in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Titus 1.2 And Peter assured all the elect that by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, their lively hope of an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that not fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for the saints, has been renewed or begotten again. Elder Bruce Lamy wrote, Hope is always centered in Christ. It always pertains to salvation in the kingdom of God. And without hope there can be no salvation. Speaking to the Lord, Moroni said, Thou hast prepared a house for man, yea, even among the mansions of my father, in which a man might have a more excellent hope. Wherefore man must hope, 
or he cannot receive an inheritance in the place which thou hast prepared. Ether 12.32. So you see how hope is not just this thing out there, well, I hope this happens. But hope in the gospel sense is almost compared with a knowledge. I have the knowledge and expectation of receiving eternal blessings. There is only one true hope, that blessed hope, and the saints are commanded to acquire it. It is one of the essential qualifications for those who labor in the ministry. None can assist in the Lord's work without it. Those who have it are not ashamed of the testimony they bear. Rather, they are commanded to be ready always to give an answer to every man for the hope that is in them. 1 Peter 3.15 Hope is born of righteousness. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. That's Proverbs 10.28 14.32 The hope of the wicked shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Job 11.20 Hope is found through the gospel. The scriptures themselves have been recorded that men might have hope. Romans, uh, Romans 15.4 And angels minister unto men to confirm that hope. Doctrine and Covenants 128.21 And those who gain the full hope of eternal life purify themselves even as Christ is pure. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Faith and hope are inseparable. This is continuing Elder McConkie. Hope enables men to have faith in the first instance, and then because of faith, that hope increases until salvation is gained. How is it that you can attain unto faith, save you shall have hope, Mormon asks. And what is it that you shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you that you shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto eternal life, and this because of your faith in him according to the promises. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope. For without faith there cannot be any hope. And again, behold, I say unto you that he cannot have faith and hope, save his shall be meek and lowly of heart. If so, his faith and hope is vain. For none is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly in heart. The meek are those who are humbled without being compelled. They choose to be humble. The lowly in heart are to know that we are insufficient without Christ. Okay. Moroni quoted the words of Ether who said, By faith all things are filled. Wherefore, who shall believe that in God might have with surety hope for a better world? Yea, even a place, place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would maketh them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to, glor to the glorified God. Then they might hope for those things which they have not seen. Wherefore ye may also have hope and be partakers of the gift, if, you have, if ye will have but have faith. Faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it, and how he wants it done, meaning submitting my will to his. If I am willing to submit my will to his in all things, then it gives me a hope, a assured expectation of being with him in the next life. Hope thus is one of the gifts of the Spirit. Now the, whole, now the God of hope filled you with all joy and peace, and in believing, Paul prayed for the Roman saints, that they may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 13. Romans 8, 26 through 27, the Spirit maketh intercession for us. To intercede 
is to plead or act on behalf of another person. In Romans 8, 26 to 27, Paul taught that at times we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Speaking of the Spirit's intercession for us, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained that the Holy Ghost gives direction to the faithful, causing them to know and speak the mind and will of the Lord. Perfect prayers are always inspired by the Spirit. They are always answered because the Spirit knows beforehand what ye should pray for. In other words, brothers and sisters, the true order of prayer is just saying what the Holy Ghost tells us to say in our prayers. That is the perfect prayer. The Holy Ghost tells us, and we repeat that in our prayers. Therefore, we would never ask for anything wrong or amiss, because the Holy Ghost never asks for anything that's wrong or amiss. Doctrine and Covenants 46, 28 through 30 says, And it shall come to pass that he that asketh in spirit shall receive in spirit, that unto some it may be given to have all those gifts, that they may be ahead, in order that every member may be profited thereby. He that asketh in the Spirit asketh according to the will of God, wherefore it is done even as he asketh. So this scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants back up what Paul is saying, that when we pray, we should be asking or saying the things what the Spirit tells us. That way, we will be asking for things according to the will of God. Romans 8, 27, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Christ our Lord is the intercessor. He it is who advocateth our cause in the courts above, and who, as Paul is about to say, maketh intercession for the saints. See verse 27. And maketh intercession for us. Verse 34. Why then does he first say that the Spirit maketh it, it? Let me say it again. Why then does he first say that the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered? Which statement the prophet Joseph Smith says should be expressed? The Spirit maketh intercession for us with strivings which cannot be expressed. The Holy. Continuing, McConkie, the Holy Ghost is a revelator who gives direction to the faithful, causing them to know and speak the mind and will of the Lord. Perfect prayers are always inspired by the Spirit, and they are always answered because the Spirit knows beforehand what we should pray for. Thus the revelation says, this is from Doctrine and Covenants 101, 27, or I'm sorry, DNC 50, 29 through 30. If ye are purified and cleansed from all sin, ye shall ask whatever you will in the name of Jesus, and it shall be done. But know this, it shall be given you what ye shall ask. So if I pray and ask for the, what the Holy Ghost tells me to ask for, then I will always get it. That is perfect prayer. Just repeating what the Holy Ghost tells us to ask. That is, the uttered prayer will become by revelation from the Spirit. Prayers during the millennium will meet this high standard of excellence, for in that day, whatsoever man shall ask, it shall be given him. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 27. Thus the Spirit maketh intercession for us, in this sense that his words and pleas are planted in the hearts of others who utter them for and on our behalf. The Son of God, for instance, whose mission is one of intercession, speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto men. That is, all his words and acts are in complete harmony with the Holy Spirit. Thus the prophet Joseph Smith taught, and he being the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and having overcome, receiveth the fullness of the glory of the Father, possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is in the Holy Spirit, 
which is the Holy Spirit, that beareth record of the Father and the Son, and these three are one. Lectures on Faith, pages 50 through 51. And so when our great intercessor mediates our cause and pleads for us, his brethren, he is pleading for the same things that are in the mind of the Holy Spirit. And in this sense, it may be said that the Spirit itself is making intercession. And similarly, when we, as moved upon by the Spirit, pray for each other, it might be said that the Spirit through us is in in interceding for the welfare of our brethren in the field of intercession, the Spirit operates through other persons. The end of Elder McConkie's quote. Romans 8.28 All things work together for good to them that love God. Elder James B. Martino of the 70s spoke about the meaning of Paul's words found in Romans 8.28 All things work together for the good of them that love God. He said, the Apostle Paul taught an interesting lesson only a few years before the saints in Rome were to face some of the most violent persecution of any Christian era. Paul reminded the saints that all things work together for good to them that love God, Romans 8.28. Our Heavenly Father, who loves us completely and perfectly, permits us to have experiences that will allow us to develop the traits and attributes we need to become more and more Christ-like. Our trials come in many forms, but each will allow us to become more like the Savior as we learn to recognize the good that comes from each experience. As we understand this doctrine, we gain greater assurance of our Father's love. We may never know in this life why we face what we do, but we can feel confident that we can grow from the experience. Unfortunately, some faithful members, as experience trials and sufferings, charge God foolishly and become offended at him that he would let them go through that, and then they leave the gospel. Romans 8.29, conformed to the image of his son. The prophet Joseph Smith spoke of what it means to be conformed to the image of the son, saying, After God had created the heavens and the earth, he said, let us make man in our image. In whose image? In the image of the gods created they them, male and female, innocent, harmless, spotless, bearing the same character and the same image as the gods. And when man fell, he did not lose his image, but his character still remained the image of his maker, Christ, who is in the image of man, is also the expressed image of his father's person. Through the atonement of Christ and the resurrection and obedience to the gospel, we shall again be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29. Then we shall have attained to the image, glory, and character of God. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Paul referred to Jesus Christ as the firstborn among many brethren. Referring to the Savior as our elder brother is indeed accurate in a sense, but it may inadvertently minimize the reverence we should give him as our Savior and as our Creator, as the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, we are far beyond Jesus Christ just being our brothers because we are brothers and sisters through the Spirit. He is so much higher and glorified than just a, a being our father, I mean, a being our brother. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained, Some Latter-day Saints have tended to focus on Christ's sonship as opposed to his godhood. As members of earthly families, we can relate to him as a child, as a son, and as a brother, because we know how that feels. We can personalize that relationship because we ourselves are children, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. For some, it may be more difficult to relate to him as a God. And so, in an attempt to draw closer to Christ and to cultivate warm and personal feelings toward him, some tend to humanize him, sometimes at the expense of acknowledging his divinity. So let us be very clear on this point. It is true that Jesus was our elder brother in the pre-mortal life, but 
We believe that in this life, it is critical that we become born again as his sons and daughters in the gospel covenant. He is so much more than just our brother in the pre-mortal life. He was a God. Romans 8, 29-30, predestination. In Romans 8, 29-30, the Greek term translated as predestinate means to appoint beforehand and refers to foreordination some people receive based on gospel knowledge to follow Jesus Christ and become like him. Foreordination does not guarantee that individuals will receive certain college responsibilities. Such opportunities come in this life as a result of the righteous exercise of agency, just as foreordination came a result of righteousness and the pre-mortal existence. I may be foreordained in the pre-earth life to perform certain things here on this earth, but those opportunities and blessings will only come as if I exercise my agency righteously. Romans 8, 28. Search diligently, pray always, and be believing, and all things shall work together for your good. If ye walk uprightly and remember the covenant, wherein ye have covenant one with another. That's Doctrine and Covenants 90, verse 24. Romans 8.29, the noble and great in the pre-existence were foreordained to gain eternal life, to become like Christ, to be his brethren in exaltation. Romans 8.30, those so foreordained are called and elected to receive the blessings of the gospel in this life. They are justified and sanctified by obedience to its laws, and they are finally glorified with Christ in exaltation. Romans 8.31, since God is on the side of his saints, what does it matter who opposes them? Romans 8.32, though God spared not his son and may not spare his saints, yet shall he not in due season give his saints all things, even as he gave them to his son? Romans 8.33-34, who then dares to condemn or lay a charge against the saints? If they do, let it be known that God shall be the final judge. Romans 8, 31-32, If God be for us, who can be against us? Paul taught that the atonement of Christ shows that God is for us and is committed to us and our eternal well-being. Because God gave even his only begotten Son for us, we can be assured that God will continue to work for our salvation and prepare us to be heirs of all he wants to give us. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland similarly exhorted members of the church, saying, Considering the incomprehensible cost of the crucifixion and atonement, I promise you he is not going to turn his back on us now. Brothers and sisters, whatever your distress, please don't give up. Romans 8.35, the love of Christ. Jesus Christ, who so loved the world that he gave his only life, that as many as would believe might become the sons of God. Romans 8.36, we are killed. I mean, it was ever thus. In every dispensation, Satan seeks to slay the saints. But, but in Paul's day... The threat of persecution and death was greater than before or since he, li he lived, as it were, in the dispensation of persecution and death. It was a horrific time during the time of the apostles and Paul, where you had the saints killed in horrible circumstances. Romans 8.37, more than conquerors. In Romans 8.37, the Greek phrase translated as more than conqueror means abundantly victorious, 
and winning an overwhelming victory. This term mirrors Paul's much more passage in Romans 5, 9 through 20, which emphasizes that the grace of God made available through the atonement of Jesus Christ is more powerful than the effects of the fall. Brothers and sisters, Paul is just telling us that Christ and those who follow him are going to win. That is who wins. We know who will win in the end. Why would you ever choose to leave the winning side is beyond me. But many do in the church. Romans 9, chapters 9 through 11. The purposes of God for Israel and the Gentiles. In Romans 9 through 11, Paul used the term Israel and Israelites instead of Jews. Paul used Israel to mean God's covenant people, the house of Israel in contrast to the Jews of his day, who had largely rejected the Savior. In Old Testament times, God had chosen the house of Israel to be his covenant people, and he promised that the Savior would come to them. But when Jesus Christ came to earth, most Jews dismissed him, and some put him to death, and his followers faced continuing opposition from Jewish leaders, who were members of the house of Israel. One of Paul's purposes in Romans chapters 9-11 through 11 was to address the Jews' rejection of the Savior and the implication of this rejection. Why did the gospel of Jesus Christ not result in more conversions among the people who had been given the promise of the Messiah? Paul maintained that Israel's refusal of the gospel did not mean that the word of God hath not hath taken none effect. Just because the Jews in general had rejected Jesus Christ, this did not make the gospel message fruitless or ineffectual. Paul reasoned that not all people who were Israel by lineage could be considered part of the covenant. Romans 9, 6, 11. The word of God was taking root among the Gentiles. Elder Bruce Lord McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, Some of the house of Israel, after such a favored birth, after being numbered with the chosen seed, turned from the course of righteousness and became children of the flesh. That is, they walked after the manner of the world, rejecting the spiritual blessings held in store for Israel. Paul also observed that Israel's rejection of the gospel and taking of the gospel to Gentiles fulfilled prophecy, verifying God's word rather than discrediting it. Romans 9, 14 through 29. Joseph Smith said, The whole of the chapter had reference to the priesthood and the house of Israel. An unconditional election of individuals to eternal life was not taught by the apostles. God did not elect or predestinate that all those who would be saved should be saved in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and through obedience to the gospel. But he passes over no man's sins, but visits them with correction. And if his children will not repent of their sins, he will discard them. Romans 9.1 For the majority of mankind, our conscience consists of the pleadings and promptings which come from the light of Christ. But to those who have entered into the covenant through baptism and have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, conscience also consists of the whisperings of the Spirit that the still small voice comes from the Holy Ghost. Romans 9, 2. Because of the Jews' rejection of the Savior, Paul's heart is heavy and sorrowful. Romans 9, 3. Paul is saying, before his conversion, Paul chose to be accursed, meaning that by, falling, by, by failing to accept Christ, he was choosing to be accursed. And this was so despite the fact he was born in the house of Israel. Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin. Romans 9, 4, Elder Bruce R. McConkie points out that to Israel, God gave six things. Number one, the adoption. Christ is the natural son of God because God is his father after the manner of the flesh. As such, he is God's heir and shall inherit all that the father hath. Those who are led by the Spirit, Romans 8, 14, are adopted into the family of God, the father, and thus they become the sons of God, joint heirs with his natural son. 
inheriting jointly with him all that the Father hath. Similarly, all those who join the church have power given them to become the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ by adoption. Doctrine and Covenants 39, 1-6 through six. To the Nephite saints of his day, who had been thus adopted, King Benjamin said, Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say, ye say, ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters. Mosiah 5, 7. Number two, the glory. Through sanctification, to behold the face of God in this life and to enter into the fullness of glory was his exaltation in life to come. Number three, the covenants. First to Abraham, then to Isaac, and then to Jacob. God gave the covenants of salvation, exaltation, and eternal increase through the patriarchal order. The blessings of these covenants were passed on to the whole house of Israel, the members of that chosen people, thus becoming the children of the covenant. 3 Nephi 20, 25-27 These same blessings are now available to Latter-day Israel are, and are in the main received by them in the temples. Number four, the giving of the law. Only Israel had either the law or the gospel or the law of Moses. Paul is here speaking of the Mosaic system, although from time to time some in Israel, as for instance, the Nephite portion of that people, did in fact have the law of the gospel in addition to the law of Moses. Number five, the service of God. Others serve tribal or local false gods. Only Israel knew the living Lord, had his laws, and were privileged to serve him, thereby becoming his heirs of salvation, and his everlasting kingdom. And number six, the promises. These include the covenants, which particular reference to the fact that the seed of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob would inherit the same blessings possessed by those ancient patriarchs. These promises have also been given to the Latter-day Saints who are gathered Israel. Romans 9, 6 through a lineage. Lineage does not determine spiritual status. Paul taught that not all people born into the house of Israel actually received the promises of the Lord's covenant with Israel. See Romans 9, 6. Paul noted that the Lord's covenant with Abraham was perpetuated only through the lineage of Isaac and not through that of Ishmael, Abraham's other son. Paul used this illustration to prepare his readers to be taught that faithful Gentiles may be counted as part of Israel and receive the blessings of the gospel covenant. Romans 9, 8, and 24, 26. Paul's teachings also show that although some may be born into a favored lineage or a family of great faith, he or she cannot receive blessings of the gospel without being obedient to God's commandments. Thus Paul states, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Similarly, a Latter-day Saint can be saved only through individual faith and obedience. President Russell M. Nelson taught that the development of faith in the Lord is an individual matter. Each of us is born individually. Likewise, each of us is born again individually. Salvation is an individual matter. Romans 9, 11, and then chapters 11, 5, 7, 28, the doctrine of the election of grace. Paul tells us here the election of grace fits into the gospel scheme. His Roman readers knew that he was talking, knew what he was talking about because they already understood the doctrine of election. Since the sectarian world has little or no comprehension of pre-existence and eternal progression upon which doctrines, the principles of election, are based, it is no wonder that these and other teachings of Paul are so completely misconstructed by them. This doctrine of the election of grace is as follows. As part of the new song the saints will sing when they see eye to eye and the millennial 
millennial era has been ushered in will be these words. The Lord hath redeemed his people Israel according to the election of grace which was brought to pass by the faith and covenant of their fathers. Doctrine and Covenants 84, 98 through 102. This election of grace is a very fundamental, logical, and important part of God's dealing with men through the ages. To bring to pass the salvation of the greatest possible number of his spiritual children, the Lord in general sends the most righteous and worthy saints to earth through the lineage of Abraham and Jacob. This, uh, this course is a manifestation of his grace, or in other words, his love, mercy, and condescension towards his children. This election to a chosen lineage is based on pre-existent worthiness and is thus made according to the foreknowledge of God, 1 Peter 1.2. Those so grouped together during their mortal probation have more abundant opportunities to make and keep the covenant's salvation, a right which they earned by pre-existent devotion to the cause of righteousness. Can you see that in the premortal life there was agency? You could listen to and accept the gospel there, or you could not. There were varying degrees of varying obedience and faith in the pre-earth life. As part of this election, Abraham and others of the noble and great spirits were chosen before they were born for the particular missions assigned them in this life. As with every basic doctrine of the gospel, the Lord's system of election based on pre-existent faithfulness has been changed and perverted by apostate Christendom. So absurd have been the false conclusions reached in this field that millions of sincere though deceived persons has devoutly believed that in accordance with divine will, men were predestined to receive salvation or damnation, which no act on their part could change. Actually, if the full blessings of salvation are to follow, the doctrine of election must operate twice. First, righteous spirits are elected or chosen to come to mortality as heirs of special blessings. Then, they must be called and elected again in this life, an occurrence which takes place when they join the church. DNC 53.1 Finally, in order to reap eternal salvation, they must press forward in obedience to devotion to the truth until they make their calling election sure, 2 Peter 1. That is, are sealed up into eternal life, Doctrine and Covenants 131.5. Romans 9, verses 11 through 13, Jacob I love, but Esau have I hated. Paul's mention of the children not yet born, Romans 9.11, refers specifically to the children of Rebekah, Esau and Jacob. See also Genesis 25, verses 21 through 26. Paul then quoted language from Micah, I'm sorry, Malachi 1, 2 through 3. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, Romans 9, 13. It seems strange that God should choose one brother to hate and one to love. But while the Greek word used here does mean hate in the same sense that we use it, the Hebrew word translated as hate carries many shades of meaning, including rejection, strong displeasure, or very commonly, loving less than. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave this explanation of Paul's words found in Romans 9, 11-13. God chose Jacob over Esau while the two were yet in Rebekah's womb and before either, as far as the work of this life are concerned, had earned any preferential status. Why? It is a pure matter of pre-existence. Jacob was coming into the world with greater spiritual capacity than Esau. He was foreordained to a special work. He was elected to serve in a chosen capacity. Jacob chose to learn and be more faithful in the pre-existence, then Esau decided to. 
Then through the lineage of Jacob, God sent those valiant spirits, those noble and great ones, who in his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge he knew would be inclined to serve him. Through Esau came those spirits of lesser valiant and devoted. Hence, in the very nature of things, many of God's seed were righteous in this life, and many of Esau's were wicked, causing Malachi to say in the Lord's name some 1,500 years later that God loved the house of Jacob and hated, or less inclined to, the house of Esau because of their unrighteous use of their agency. Romans 9, 14 through 24 is their unrighteousness with God. As Paul wrote about the foreordination of the house of Israel, he realized that some church members might feel that the doctrine of, the, of election was unfair. Gentile saints might have wondered why God restricted his covenant anciently to Abraham and his descendants, while Jewish Christians might have wondered why God would accept Gentiles into the church and consider them as part of the house of Israel. Paul's counsel to his readers was not to dispute against God. See Romans 9.20 footnote A in this very verse implied means contradict or dispute. Why try to dispute with God and his plan? Then Paul asked, is God unrighteous because he favors some people over others? The Israelites over the Egyptians, for instance. Those who so maintain, Paul says, are resisting God and contending against him. The rationale of his argument is, of course God is just in having a chosen people. For they earn the right to their preferential status by obedience and conformity and pre-existence. This same explanation shows why some people are born into the world as natural heirs of the priesthood and others are denied the fullness of his blessings. God favors us, but that favoring is blessed upon our use of agency. So all can be favored of God if they so choose to use their agency in righteousness. Romans 9, 17 through 18, and verses 22 through 24. Does God cause people to be hard-hearted? In Romans 9, 17, Paul quoted Exodus 9, 16, which states that God raised up Pharaoh in order to show his power. Paul also said, whom God will he harden us? Romans 9, 18. These passages do not mean that God caused Pharaoh or other people to be wicked. Such an interpretation would contradict truth taught elsewhere in the scriptures about how God desires the salvation of all people and how God's gift of agency makes us free to, makes us free to choose to follow him or reject him. A key to understanding Paul's statement is to recognize that he was reasoning from the book of Exodus which tells of the Pharaoh who opposed God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt. The Exodus account, which would have been familiar to Paul's readers, speaks of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. For example, see Exodus 9.12. The Joseph Smith translation, however, clarifies that the Lord did not harden Pharaoh's heart, but that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. See the Joseph Smith translation in Exodus 12.9, that would be footnote A. Paul point, Paul's point was that even though Pharaoh fought against God, this did not frustrate the Lord's work of delivering Israel. Ultimately, Israel's deliverance, in spite of Pharaoh's stubbornness, served to reveal the Lord's power, Romans 9.17. Similarly, God did not cause Israel to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he permitted it. Israel rebellion was something God endured with much long suffering, Romans 9.22, so that he could make known the riches of his glory to those who accept the gospel, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, Romans 9.23-24. Romans 9.22, vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, meaning the rebellious and disobedient, those as the seed of Esau who wasted the days of their, their probation and walked in cor carnal paths while they, they were here in mortality. 
Romans 9.23, vessel of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, meaning obedient and righteous persons, those as the seed of Israel who were foreordained of pre-earth life to receive that glory, which is eternal life. Romans 9.20 and 25-29, Paul quoted from the Old Testament. In Romans 9.25-26, Paul quoted from Hosea 1, verse 10, and chapter 2, verse 23. He refers to Hosea as Osea. In Romans 9.29, then quoted from Isaiah 1.9 and 29.16. See Romans 9.20. By referring to these Old Testament prophets, Paul taught that God's desire is to save all his children and that many Gentiles who are not of his people by birth will become his people by being grafted into the gospel covenant. Romans 30 through chapter 9, 30 through 33, Paul then reasons, what then is the conclusion of the whole matter? It is that the Gentiles who once were unrighteous have now become righteous through Christ. It is that the Jews, supposing that the law alone is enough, have failed to gain righteousness through Christ. He became a stumbling block to them. And it is that both Jew and Gentile can be saved in Christ. We'll change that to that was Romans 9, verses 30. 33. L. M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that Latter-day Saints sometimes commit a similar error by placing too much emphasis on works. No matter how hard we work, no matter how much we obey, no matter how many good things we do in this life, it would not be enough if it were not for Jesus Christ and His loving grace. On our own, we cannot earn the kingdom of God, no matter what we do. Unfortunately, there are some within the church who have become so preoccupied with performing good works that they forget that those works, as good as they may be, are hollow unless they are accompanied by a complete dependence on Christ. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.